starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, uh, good afternoon everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on the big topic of value-added tax and what you need to know about it if you are a first-time exporter. It's the latest installment in this year's ongoing webinar program. We run a monthly webinar program and um, this is the latest. My name is William Barnes Graham. I'm the digital content at digital content manager at Open to Export. We are a government-supported online community uh, helping small UK businesses get ready to sell overseas through our step-by-step -step articles and guides, regular webinars, RC Experts Forum, and our Export Action Plan tool. Please visit the site uh, to check these out. You can ask questions at any point during the webinar using the question box on the right-hand side of the control panel. We will get to as many of these as we can at the end. With the questions, we will be reposting some of them onto the forum following the webinar. We will then reassign these questions to your user account if you're registered with the site. This will allow you to get answers straight to your inbox within a week or so. We don't typically share the slides from the presentation, but we will be recording today's session and sending you a copy of it within a week, as well as uploading it to our website where you can view this and all of our previous webinars. Leading the presentation today is Liz Maher from Centurion VAT. Liz started her career in VAT in her, at Her Majesty's Customs and Excise before moving to Ernst & Young, where she became the first female um, Director of Corporate VAT Services in the UK before joining Centurion in 2002. Centurion have been providing a wide range of businesses and public sector bodies with VAT support since 1998. Before handing over to Liz, we're going to do a quick poll. Um, so I'm just going to launch that now. The question is, to what extent are you concerned about the potential effect of Brexit on how you do VAT um, in, in Europe as an exporter? So I'll just leave that poll to run for a few seconds. Getting some interesting answers in. So I'm just going to close that in five, four, three, two, one. And here are the results. So yes, yeah, some concern. Um, a lot of people not sure as well. So it's probably relatively reflective of uh, the national mood on all sorts of things related to Brexit. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Liz. Lovely. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, as William said, welcome to the wonderful world of VAT. Shall I just deal with the issue as to the Brexit concerns straight away? Um, VAT is a European-based tax, and, and we've got it because we joined the, uh, the European single market back in uh, 1973. But the way in which uh, VAT works as a value-added tax is something that's actually been taken on by about 115 countries across the globe. And that's primarily because it's a very effective tax generator generated about 115 billion here in the UK. So whatever the discussions turn out like uh, in terms of how we Brexit and what post-Brexit looks like, the anticipation would be that a VAT system would remain in place. And a further point would be that of those 115 countries who use a VAT system, a lot of it is predicated on the European legislation. So the language that you will hear in countries such as even China, uh, Panama, uh, Bahamas, still talks of language around taxable supplies, exempt supplies, input tax, and would very much be familiar to many of you in terms of your understanding of the UK VAT system. So will something change immediately with regard to Brexit and VAT? And the answer to that should be no, because we are actually still part of the European Union and still governed by the principal directive. There is a lot of activity going on to legally compare the wording in uh, the European legislation to that of 
um, the UK legislation just to make sure it, it's fully reflective. Um, going forward, yes, there may well be issues that we'll have to address, particularly in regard to simplification and around exporting. That might be triangulation issues where there are three partners to a transaction, all of them in different European member states. Now, there is a simplification there that allows us not to have to register in every European member state. So those are the things that might be lost. However, you would want to ensure that they were very much covered as part of the negotiations. So for those of you who've got an immediate concern, I, I, I would sort of reflect on the fact nothing is going to change immediately. What the new post-Brexit VAT arrangements look like should be similar, but we will have to pay close attention to what is being planned. Now, we're going to concentrate today very much on the dispatching of goods, um, and we're going to talk about the, the state within the European Union, obviously, and also exporting outside of the European Union to the rest of the world. Um, as you can see on the slide, I've already touched on the referendum implications, um, and the fact that, yes, we, I think we can expect issues to, to change, but it's very much carry on as you are at the moment. There was a, a European VAT action plan issued in April of, of this year, which did touch on issues around small businesses and the role of VAT in the digital services market. And for those that you operate with MOSS, the uh, mini one stop shop, there were various plans announced in there. Now, obviously, we still need to keep an eye on what that action plan delivers. Um, so, you know, there is stuff to be aware of, um, which will impact not just on goods providers through triangulation, but on service providers. So, if we consider the uh, the next slide, um, if, just to reflect on the fact that when you're new to exporting, you obviously have, have a view of where the European Union is. Now, we have a, a European Union for VAT purposes, and it consists of, of the countries listed on that slide there. But we also do have to be very careful that there are actually parts of those European Union member states, which actually you might think of as being in the European Union, but are not. So, for example, within Italy, you have the Vatican State. The Vatican State is not part of the European Union for VAT purposes. And there'll be other examples which will affect other countries uh, around Greece, um, Spain, and Portugal. So just be aware of the rules are very specific as to whether you are exporting or dispatching goods to a member of a European member state. So if we then move on to the next slide, you can see where I've listed a few there. One of the other ones which commonly people get confused over is Norway and Switzerland, uh, particularly as both of those are part of various trading agreements. But for VAT purposes, if we dispatch goods to Norway, we are actually governed under the normal VAT exporting rules rather than the EU rules for acquisition. So, moving on. I didn't want to assume any knowledge uh, in, in terms of the audience here today, so apologies if you're all VAT experts or, already. But just a, a, a little slide to reflect on the fact that you know VAT is very much a tax on transactions. It's not whether you make a profit on the sale of those goods into the Europe or into the rest of the world. It's whether you've made an actual supply. And that will determine what the VAT treatment on that. And importantly, within this subject we're talking about today, it will also determine what you do in terms of intrastat or EC sales reporting as well. So we're very much looking at issues around correct accounting of VAT on the tax side, but also where those movements of goods go in terms of statistical reporting which today isn't part of the conversation, but I think it's important for you to recognize that you know, there is documentation that you have to complete. And the whole driver to, to VAT revenue that HMRC have is that you are declaring the right amount of tax at the right time. Now, that's particularly important with exporting because effectively exports attract the zero rate of VAT. And as you can see on the next slide, the zero rate is still a taxable supply. And that's important to you as business owners because you need to know what taxable supplies you make to be VAT registered and you need to know what taxable supplies you make because that accounts for the VAT recovery on your costs. Now, exports fall to be zero rated supplies. 
but because you're effectively not charging 20% VAT on them, the revenue are very, very keen to ensure you've got the right evidence to support the fact that those goods have left the UK, whether they've gone to Europe or gone to the rest of the world, you've got to have proof that you've met the conditions. If not, you as the supplier are exposed to having to pay the 20% VAT and potentially try and get that back from your customer. Now, the revenue's interpretation of these rules are that they expect you to correctly account for VAT, so if you are at all nervous about getting the right evidence from your customer, the revenue's view would be simply charge them 20% VAT. Now, we all know the issue that will have in terms of commerciality and winning opportunities to sell uh, goods overseas, but it is an important point to reflect on. And I would very much point out the fact that the revenue are interested particularly in export evidence at the moment and are undertaking a series of visits um, which is, is, is raising quite a large number of penalties and assessments for those businesses who don't have the right evidence for export. So, in terms of today, as I say, what I wanted to concentrate on was exporting goods. That is not to ignore the number of VAT implications that impact on services. And this little chart just tries to bring together in a visual way the various influencing factors. So, in goods, we will need to understand whether we're dealing with business customers or non-business customers. On the services side, not only do we have to assess that point, but we also have to think about what is actually the nature of the service that we're providing. So let's concentrate, as I said, on the goods side. And within exporting goods, we have to consider whether those are European Union member state customers or whether they're countries and customers which are outside the EU. And you'll see the logic that applies to both of those in terms of whether they are business or what we call non-business customers. So some jargon to get out of the way very quickly is the, the phrase exports or dispatches. If we're delivering and selling goods to a destination outside the European Union, we call those exports. That's a traditional export. However, if we're selling goods into a destination which is within the EU for that purposes, we talk about those as being dispatches. And there are different VAT regulations and reporting ob obligations that apply to both of those. In terms of the discussion around EU dispatches, so these are goods that you are selling to customers in France, Germany, Poland, etc., that are part of the European member states. Another aspect to recognize and record within your accounting in information is the time at which you make those supplies. Now that is important because you have certain deadlines from that time of supply to obtain the VAT evidence to support the fact you've not charged VAT on that supply. So you can see here that for an EU dispatch, the time of supply is the 15th day of the month following the one in which you sent the goods to your customer or your customer takes them away. Or alternatively, it's the date you issue the invoice, and it's the earlier of all of those points is the time of the supply that you're making. So if you pre-invoice because it's a new customer, then that's going to be the, 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 the trigger for the time of supply and for the evidence uh, deadlines after that point. So what actually are the zero rating conditions for EU dispatches? Well, fundamentally and key, is that you obtain and state on your sales invoice to your customer their EU VAT registration number. Now, you have access to these uh, HMRC website will include the, this information as well, the Europa website, in terms of the, the two-digit code. Obviously, the VAT registration number is very particular to your customer. So that's important that you get that. And I would also encourage you to check that. Um, not to accept it at face value. It might look in the right format, it might be the right series of numbers, but is it actually the right number for that customer that you're dealing with? Because believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, people do make up numbers. Now, the other important condition is not just to get the VAT number of your customer and state it on your sales invoice, but also to ensure the goods are removed from the UK to a destination in another European member state. And, and these are all underlined because they're important, that you obtain and um, keep valid commercial evidence 
that the goods have been removed from the UK and you've got that three month time limit from that time of supply to make sure you've amassed that commercial evidence. Now the reason that we talk about commercial evidence in terms of supporting the fact that goods have been removed from the UK is that we're in the U European Union at the moment, we've got a single market, there are no customs borders for us to cross, so we're not going to get official stamp documentation that the goods have crossed a border within the European Union. That's in effect the whole point of the single market, the goods flow freely. So you are in this instance looking at commercial evidence and we'll talk a little later as to what we mean by that commercial evidence. Now to come back to the points I made earlier about the VAT registration numbers and the importance that you show that you've checked that, the obvious question is well how do I check that? And you can see on the third bullet point there that there is a, it's a free to access, it's a, a European website that um, you can find out whether that is still a VAT valid number and it should indicate the, the name of the business it's related to. Now there are some in-country variations as you can see noted there, but it's really important that you take the time periodically to do a random sample on invoices, on VAT numbers given to you by your, your customers. And the reason that I say that is because if you do end up making an error in VAT, what you will find is you'll be exposed to a penalty on top of that which can be 30% of the VAT in error. Now you can reduce that 30% penalty if you show you've taken reasonable care. And a good example of taking reasonable care in making sure you declare the right amount of tax at the right time is that you do simple compliance checks such as making sure you've got the right VAT registration number for your EU customer. In addition, as I say, to having that number, we need some commercial evidence that the goods have, have left the country. And that could be supported by other commercial evidence that the sale has actually taken place. So that ancillary evidence might be your sales contract, it might be emails uh, uh, talking about where the goods are to be delivered and dispatched and how they're to be transported. Now there isn't anything specifically that says what the commercial evidence is. The legal statement in the HMRC documentation, which does have the force of law, talks of proof of re uh, removal of the goods in an EU context. And it talks about documents, as you can see here, which give all the information about the supplier, the consigner, the customer, the goods, etc., how they're going out of the country. So think about the way in which you would evidence that the goods have been removed. That could be haulage invoices, it could be ferry tickets, it could be carrier notes, all amassed together as proof of removal. Now the next slide is where there is a particular concern where you might not actually be the person responsible for the mode of delivery and that's what we call an indirect dispatch. So a direct dispatch, you are effectively delivering goods as well as supplying the goods indirect dispatches, the, the customer potentially is going to come to your factory, to come to your building, pick up the goods and take them out of, uh, out of the UK. Now you have got less control over those, those evidence, so you've got to have a, a situation in place, an agreement in place that your customer will actually provide you with the information to show that they have taken the goods out of the UK. And again, there's a whole load of useful pointers on here in terms of the sorts of things that would be additional requirements for those indirect exports. Now, there could be a whole range of other intra-EU transactions where you are moving goods from the UK out and even potentially back again. I've listed them there, we haven't got the time to go through every one of them in detail, but it's just to flag out that these are particular areas where you might need to do a bit of a further research to understand how it impacts on your own organization. To deal with one of them in particular which regularly causes us issues and that's the difference between consignment or call off stock. And this is so important because we have to be very careful that we aren't creating a place of supply in another member state for our UK business because we are holding stock there. So we need to understand if we have got stock in other European member states, how is that stock being held? Is it being held as consignment stock or is it held as call-off stock? 
And if you read through the slide, you will see that consignment stock is potentially a concern because effectively it's our stock. It sat, say, in a warehouse in France because we're thinking of expanding into the French market. We haven't got customers for, for them. But when we have got customers, they're ready in country to be sold. And the fact that the goods are in the country at the time they are sold will create a place of supply and therefore a VAT registration in that country for you. So please be very clear about how you deal with stock that you're moving across the European member states. If it's call-off stock, then effectively we're saying we've sold it to a customer, it's their stock, and therefore they can draw it down when they need it. And those movements of goods can still qualify for zero rating, subject to you having the customer's VAT number in country. And they won't necessarily trigger an in-country VAT registration for you as a UK business. Now, another area that often causes um, questions is about movements of goods between a series of, of transactions in the EU. And this is the word we use to describe this is triangulation. And, and literally just think of it as a triangle. You might be the supplier, but you might be asking a third party to provide the goods to you, but then deliver those goods to your end customer. And there is a simplification which allows us not to have to be VAT registered in the country of the end customer receiving the goods, subject to us meeting all of the conditions. And I've just put in a little visual slide so you can get a sense as to what I'm talking about in terms of the movement of goods as distinct from the movement of the invoicing process. And as I say, if you are in these sorts of situations, you, you are exposed potentially without this simplification rule to having to be registered in, in the end um, country of the customer because you're deemed to be in that country when you supply the goods to them. So the simplification gets rid of that risk of exposure to that registration. And you should really be noting on your sales invoices that um, you know it's subject to a, a triangulation simplification. Now, not everybody is dealing with goods sold to a business customer who will provide them with their VAT registration, which is the one route to securing zero rating plus the evidence of the goods. Some of us on this uh, webinar might actually be involved in selling goods to non-business customers. And this is where we need to be aware of two aspects. If some of you are retailers, can you take advantage of zero rating the supply of those goods to the customers who come into their shop by using the retail export scheme? Now, you don't have to use the retail export scheme, but obviously if you want to zero rate the sale to that customer, this is the route through which you've got to work it. So it depends on whether you're impacted by that area in the retail environment. For those of you who might be engaged in selling goods online, then you need to look at the distance selling rules. Then this would be where you're perhaps sat in the UK, you've got a, a website, and you are selling, physically selling goods via the internet, um, and people are paying for those goods through your website, and you are moving those goods overseas. And they're not going to be VAT registered customers, they're going to be Joe Blogs downloading an app, buying something, you know, a handbag from you that you've made or something like that. Now, under the distance selling rules, you, if you're VAT registered in the UK, obviously you'll be charging VAT at the UK basis to those non-taxable people in France. You charge them VAT until the point which you trigger the distance selling registration or hold in that particular country. And as you can see from the bullet points there, the distance selling thresholds vary between 35 euros and 100,000 euros depending on each, cust uh, in, on each country. But when the value of your goods to private individuals goes over that, you have to VAT register in that country and start charging French VAT if you're then registered in France, German VAT if you're registered in Germany. So that's a, a very quick run through of, of EU dispatches on goods. And if we're then looking to the rest of the world, we then revert to the phrase exports. And we have to be very clear, do we meet the definition of being an exporter? So in a normal parlance, you own goods, you export them, you arrange for them to be delivered to an overseas person, somebody outside the European Union. And you can see there, we need to be clear that they're not resident in the UK, they've got no business establishment here in the UK, um, or understand if they're an overseas authority, perhaps in a public sector body or charity. 
we've got a slightly different time of supply. Remember that 15th day of the, the month earlier. In this regard, we're talking about um, the time of supply being the earlier of simply the date you send the goods to your customer or the customer takes them away or the date you receive full payment. What is it the earlier of, of those two points? And again, we will have issues in terms of direct and indirect exports. Indirect exports, again, being the problem area to manage risk because you're not in, in control of delivery. So for exports to Japan, America, countries outside the European Union for VAT purposes, these are the conditions that you need to follow. Again, you've got a three-month time limit to physically move the goods out of the EU. But it's not just saying out of the UK, it's out of the EU. And you've got that three-month time limit to obtain the evidence of the export, and you've got to provide that evidence. And that could be official in this case is because we are crossing borders potentially. So a couple of factors there to bear in mind. Now, we talked of proof of removal on the uh, dispatches side. Effectively, we're talking proof of export, much the same sort of rules. And again, I've put in some examples here as the nature of the official evidence, the stuff that you will get through from HMRC in terms of the online uh, goods departure message if you're using that system, or if you're using paper copies of the SAD, the single administrative document, or the C88, it is the stamped copies of those paper documents that are official evidence that the goods have left. That is, can be supported by any number of items you can see listed there, CMR, CIR, C, CIMs, depending on whether they're going by rail, rail freight or, or road. All of that bundled together. And the really important message is not to rely as finance people on a logistics person who's saying, yeah, 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 I've got that. Because you can guarantee when you get an inspection in the finance team and you're asked to provide the evidence, you will be scrabbling around to find it because they'll say, oh, I didn't know you actually meant that as well. And as I say, it is very particularly noticeable at the moment, the amount of um, work that's going on to buy the revenue to look at proof of export. So what happens if you don't meet any of these conditions uh, for zero rating, your EU dispatches, or your rest of the world exports. Well, as I said at the outset, quite simply, the revenue expect you to declare 20% of the VAT on that supply on your VAT return. So if you haven't got the evidence in the right time scale, that will be the view that they will take. And it's only going to be reversible if you can, at a later date, obtain the adequate proof of removal or proof of export. Now, just to give you an illustration, I've had a client recently, a reasonable sized client, £9 million turnover, received an assessment for the lack of VAT evidence on exporting in the sum of £1 million of VAT. Because the revenue can go back four years to check. The, the exports that you've zero rated. Now, this unfortunate business, they managed to find, it took a lot of management time to get the right evidence, a lot of conversations with, with clients. They managed to get it. They thought they could reverse that £1 million assessment, but they were still left with a 30% penalty because they had not demonstrated reasonable care. So they were still left with a £300,000 VAT bill because of the errors that had, had happened within their record keeping. And don't forget, in addition to penalties, there will be interest to be paid on, on, on top of that. So recognize this is a really important issue. It's not there to stop you exporting. You know, I export VAT services, believe it or not, um, you know, delivering training and, and advice across uh, the globe. Um, anybody can export and we can be encouraged to do that. What we must make sure is that we've got the evidence in place and we understand particularly for goods and services the VAT rules that we need to apply in order to secure that zero rating. Now that's been a very quick run through some of the key issues that will impact on those of you who are exporting goods. Um, I'll revert back now to, uh, to Will, as I know we've had a number of questions already which I'm more than happy to answer, um, and obviously my contact details and that of the team 
are on the system for you should that be required. So I'll hand you back over now to Will. Hello, Will, are you there? Hi, Liz. Um, yeah, thank you. Really great presentation. Um, really gave a great overview of um, VAT and special for goods. And um, yeah, um, let's, let's get crack into, cracking with the questions. So the first question we had uh, was regarding is there a big difference between sales and use tax and VAT? Um, and the second part of our question is, is there nexus within VAT? Yeah, okay. Um, I think probably they meant sales and use tax, um, probably rather than use tax. Um, there is a difference between it. A, a sales tax is very much generating revenue out on the selling price, um, whereas VAT is effectively generated because you've got um, a profit margin each time you buy and sell goods in. So you incur VAT on the goods that you buy in. You, if you're in business and your VAT registers, you recover that VAT, you then add your profit margin and you sell on those goods and you charge VAT on the sale value of those goods. So you're recovering input tax, paying over output tax, and it is actually the difference between the output tax and the input tax is the revenue that's been generated. So it's, it's the VAT on the margin, whereas a sales tax is, is almost creates a tax on tax situation in the supply chain, because each seller is charging a sales tax that isn't recoverable by the next person, it's absorbed into their costing structure, they add their profit margin and then add their sales tax. So there is a real difference uh, between the way in which a sales tax operates and a VAT indirect tax operates, which is why VAT has taken off in the way that it has across the globe. Thank you, Liz. Um, and we've got a question here from Dawn, which is kind of um, might help to kind of as an example of a, of a real life situation. And it's how is VAT accounted when our US customer buyer requests delivery of the goods to a EU, EU consignee? yet invoice to the US buyer. Yeah, now that, that's, that is a really good example and, and that illustrates the complexity of, of the way in which VAT works because remember, we have separate rules for EU dispatches into EU customers as from the rest of the world. So in this instance, you would look at it and say, oh, I remember Liz saying about a triangle. Is this a triangle? Well, in this instance, it's not. You can't use triangulation relief rules. Um, where you've got one part of the supply chain outside the European Union. So we can't use triangulation to answer this question. We have to revert to the basic VAT rules on EU dispatches. Now, this is a dispatch of goods from the UK to an EU consignment, a customer in the, in the EU. And therefore, in order for the UK company to be able to zero rate that, the rules for EU dispatches say, well, I've got to have the customer's VAT number. But my customer in the UK is actually the US business, and they haven't got a, a, uh, a European VAT number. So the issue for this, in order for the UK, is, is it's actually an exposure to the US buyer, and you, they will potentially face the fact that they are in that uh, European country of their customer, and it is in that country that they are acquiring the goods from you, the supplier, in the UK. Because they're in that um, EU uh, customer country, they have to be VAT registered there because they're selling those goods on. Let's give a practical example. The, the customer's in France, so the US um, uh, supplier is acquiring goods from the UK, it's acquiring those goods in France, and it's then selling them on to the French customer. So for the UK business to zero rate that supply, it's got to have the French VAT number of the US business that's VAT registered there. Without that VAT number, it fails on the conditions for zero rating under EU dispatches, which is I've got to have an EU VAT number and I've got to move the goods to an EU state. Well, yeah, I can move the goods, but I haven't got an EU VAT number to use. And the exposure is on the US company to be VAT registered in France. Okay. Thank you, Liz. That was very, um, very far. Um, and we've got a question, we've, we've had a few questions in from Phil Gordon. Uh, we're going to just ask one for now. Um, and the first is, obtaining an EORI number without a VAT, is this possible if business initially, um, if business is initially less than the VAT registration threshold? 
Yeah, it, it is. Uh, the economic operator registration indicator is simply, a, it's a, a customs process registration. It, it replaced, for those who are listening, it replaced the old turn numbers that we would have had. Now, normally, you'd expect your turn number to be your VAT number in the UK with three digits at the end. Um, so that's the sort of format that it will look like. But you don't have to be VAT registered in the UK to, to get uh, an EORI number. Great, thank you. Um, and we've had a question uh, just asking for a, po a point of clarification. Um, it's a confusion between the difference between three month rule for all proof of export and 15 days. What is, what is the difference? Sorry, can you repeat the question, William? I didn't get that one. So, um, Someone from BristolMade.com is confused by the difference between three month, the three month rule for proof of export and fifteen day proof. Right. Okay. The 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 fifteen day point is about um, the the time of the supply. So if you think about it, if you make a supply of goods, the revenue is going to say, well, when does the three months rule kick in? When do I have to make sure I've got the evidence in by? So they set a rule which says, well, this supply happened on this date. So if you go back to the EU dispatches, you will see that the, the date of the time of the supply is determined as the earlier of the date the invoice was raised or the 15th day of the month following the date you move the goods. So you move the goods in January. If you haven't raised an invoice by the 15th of February, the 15th of February becomes your time of supply. That 15th of February is then the starting point for your three months ticking away to make sure you've got the movement of the goods out of the country within those three months and you've got your collection of evidence within that three months. So they're two different things. One is about when do you set the time of the supply and the other is, well, once you've set that, you've got three months from that date to make sure you've got the right evidence in place. Thank you. Um, as you said earlier, the, the presentation mostly kind of focused on goods. And we've had a question here about services. It's from Ian, and he asks, how do you account for VAT on services, whether services are provided in the UK, for example, consultancy? Right. Um, if we were to talk about services, we'd probably have to spend about an hour and a half explaining the different rules that apply to different types of services. You need with your, uh, for service providers to understand where your customer is, are they in the UK? And also you need to understand what the nature of your supply of services is and is it caught under a place of supply rule that forces it to be happening in the country where the service is performed. So I'll give a very practical example of that. Um, you might be an estate agent here in the UK and you might have a, uh, a private customer in France and they want you to sell their holiday home which is in Germany. So that is, although it's a service, where is it actually deemed to supply? taking in, in, in account where the customer is based and where the property is based. And for services that are deemed to relate to land, which a state agency selling a property is, the service is deemed to happen in Germany because that's where the building is. So unfortunately, it's very difficult to answer a, in, a, in a general sense on a if I supply a service because we do need to understand what is the nature of the service and where is the customer and also is that customer a business customer or um, a private individual. Now there is what we call the general rule to apply on um, the supply of services which is if it's business to business the general rule is we wouldn't charge UK VAT it would be the customer that would account for what we call VAT under a reverse charge in the European member state they were in. But that is a general rule which would still be undermined if it was services relating to land, services relating to performances, um, education delivered overseas, uh, repair on goods carried out overseas. So it would be dangerous to generalize. Okay. Um, and you've had, uh, we'll probably ask only one or two more questions because um, I don't want to keep up on too long. But we've had one or two questions about uh, proof of evidence. 
uh, one from P. Macintosh is, uh, we only get POE through email. How do we obtain a paper copy as customers are likely to want to keep the original? Right. Um, when you talk about proof of export, uh, are they saying what, what sort of evidence are they saying is coming? Oh, we don't. We won't know that. Um, I think you really have to make sure that you are not left exposed to that. And I'm particularly thinking of situations where you might be making disposals of goods and you know you may have made that disposal say two years ago, the company has now gone into liquidation and you can't get the right evidence from them because they just don't exist anymore. Um, so emailable e evidence, it depends if you mean they're attaching an email version of the document, they've scanned the document in, or they just send you an email saying, oh gee, thanks very much, yes, the goods have arrived safely, I'm in Poland. You know, if, it, if it's the, the latter, then that's not going to be proof of export. If it's, yeah, I'll send you scanned copies of all the stamped um, documentation, um, you know, the signature of, of the, the, the warehouse team, the official stamp of the carrier, anything like that. If I'm sending you scanned copies, that may be absolutely well and good. But a simple email saying, yes, I've got the goods is not enough. Thank you, Liz. I hope that's helped um, some people with um, questions about, about proof, of evidence, uh, proof of export there. Um, and our last question, I think, is from Melanie. She asks, is the EU VAT threshold an annual one, or once it's reached, does a company have to charge local VAT for all future sales? Um, Right. Once uh, VAT thresholds are determined annually, uh, remember in the UK that's on a rolling basis. So at the end of each month, you need to work out should I be VAT registered if I've gone over currently 83,000. That is the the normal rule, as I understand it, across uh, the European member states. So it, yes, it's a it's a it's a turnover figure because if you think alike with the distance selling. The, the distance selling threshold in France might be 35,000 euros. If you had a really good month, you might do that in one month. So, or it might take you three months to do that. So you, you've got, it is an annual um, turnover figure, but you've got to be managing it on a, on a regular basis. Cool, thank you, Liz. And on that note, I think it's probably time for us to wrap up. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be posting these questions on our forum in the aftermath to this webinar. So please do keep your eyes peeled with these and let us know also if you'd like to withdraw your question from this process. Thank you once again to Liz for a really great presentation and some really good answers as well. It's a really important part of the export process to get things like VAT right and just to avoid potential hassle further down the line. So I hope everyone's found that useful. And thank you once again, Liz. Thanks very much. Our next webinar is on August 24th, and it's on international brand appeal and overcoming some of the mistakes that exporters tend to make when launching their brand overseas. Bob McInnes from Duffy Agency will be presenting that webinar, which is definitely something to look forward to. You can register to this on our site by going to our upcoming webinars link in the highlights tab. And the registration link will also be circulated to everyone who registered today to today's webinar, along with a recording of today's webinar, which will be uploaded onto YouTube. You can watch any of our previous webinars on demand by going to the highlights tab on Open to Export and selecting recent or upcoming webinars from the drop down. That's all from us for now. Thank you everyone for attending. Please take a survey as you exit to let us know what you thought of today's webinar and to give suggestions for future webinars and future topics. Thank you for attending and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you.